Thank you. Thank you, John and Kiki. Uh, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we begin this new series, we pray you do exactly what we just heard uh, Kiki singing about and John playing. Just the idea, open our hearts, Lord. Open our hearts to what you want to do. In this series, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached, as we hear the call of Jesus to, to move our spiritual lives up a whole new level, a whole new notch. Lord, speak to us. Prepare us for what you want to do in us. And Lord, draw us into this journey together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are starting a new series called Take It Up a Notch. We're using a cooking theme. I'll explain to you why in just a minute. Uh, but in the meantime, go ahead and watch the screens. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Are you ready for week one of the food battle? This week we have two fierce competitors trying to earn the favor of the judge. The first competitor is Shoreline's Women's Ministry. Give it up for Shoreline's Women's Ministry. Every ministry of Shoreline Community Church exists to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. Shoreline's Women's Ministry lives out this mission as they help women live with Christ, live like Christ, and live for Christ. They believe these three goals capture the heart of God for every woman. And their competitor, who's also ready to win this battle, is the Tech Ministry. Give it up for Tech Ministry! The production's team mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ by creating a pure technical experience at each Shoreline gathering. The lights, the stage crew, and the sound mix are all part of the technical experience. They feel it is a win for their team if none of these elements detract from the guest experience. This underscores the church's mission of helping as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. Here we go, week one of the battle. Well, competitors, I want to let you know that as I try your dishes today, I'm going to be judging you on three different elements. First of all, presentation. How does it look? Second of all, does it remind me of what it's supposed to remind me of, which today is a hot dog? And third of all, have you taken it up a notch? Have you got a, a new look at an old familiar recipe? So I'm going to begin with the tech ministry. Tell me about your dish, Jill. Well, our hot dog is a, um, a little different take on the traditional southern hot dog all the way. There is ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, onions, chili, coleslaw, jalapeno nacho cheese, and barbacoa on that dog. All right. And remember, I am preaching. Look, look how well lit that dog is, actually. Thank you, tech person, but in my family, sucking up never helps, so remember that, okay? Oh, man. Mmm. Wow. That is glorious. Thank you so much. Women's ministry, tell me about your hot dog. Okay, Pastor Kevin, be careful here because we have a chili verde chili hot dog with hot habanero cheese and a deep fried jalapeno on top. Do you guys notice how well you can hear Kim right now as she describes that hot dog? Oh, wait, Stop. don't don't let me forget, it's a homemade pretzel bun, Jill. We couldn't do that because we had to get here at 645 this morning. Well, we have a great no, team. Ladies, ladies, settle down. Work. Okay, wow. Wow. All right. I've made my decision. Tech Ministry, a fantastic hot dog. Delicious, wonderful, spicy. Move my heart, and it might move my heart later as well. <laughs> Women's Ministry, phenomenal, incredible. I, I, it's close. It's so close. I almost can't, but I have to go with 
I'm going to go with... I'm gonna... <laughs> wait, wait, hey, hey. Put up a play. Uh, tech ministry wins again. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you, guys. That's a clean sweep. Thank you. If this is your first week visiting Shoreline, you're wondering, this is church. Uh, wait a minute, time out. We love to have fun, but we get very, very serious about the Word of God. And what we try to do, I began working on this series and planning it probably nine or ten months ago. Our tech team, with our arts team, with our music team, all of them worked together probably three or four months ago to, to try to tie into our minds a picture that will remind us, not just in two months, but in 20 or 30 years, hopefully you'll remember this summer. 2015, when we talked about taking it up a notch. You'll remember the fun cooking competition, which we're going to do every single week. I rarely eat right before I preach. but uh, And just, we're having fun, but the idea is this, to take it up a notch, to take old familiar recipes and do something completely new with it, because that's exactly what Jesus did. In the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to spend the whole summer on the Sermon on the Mount. I'm excited. I get to preach the first five weeks in the series. I love preaching, and I get to kick off the series. And, and, so, and then we've got some guest preachers coming through the summer. We're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's chapter 5, 6, and 7, all summer long. And if you follow our Bible reading, you will have read the Sermon on the Mount twice this last week. And if you follow the Bible reading that's in your bulletin on the website, you'll read the Sermon on the Mount every week all summer long. And you'll get to know it really well. And in the Sermon on the Mount, we're using this image of taking it up a notch about new recipes, kind of new, new looks at old familiar things, because Jesus says six different times in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said this, but I tell you this, and he takes it up a notch, and we're going to listen to what God has to say. And this first week, our theme is on the passage where Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, do not commit murder. But we're talking about how murder is more than just killing someone. Murder is bigger than that, and Jesus forces us to go past the idea of, okay, well, I didn't kill anybody, so I guess I'm covered there, and he takes it up one, two, three notches. Three times Jesus pushes us beyond just the idea of not killing to more than that because he wants to spice up and change our spiritual lives. When, Jesus, when we hear Jesus say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, understand that Jesus is not contradicting the teachings of Scripture. Jesus is not looking back at the Old Testament and saying, oh, that's not true, it's supposed to be this. The Bible says that he comes to fulfill the law and the prophets. Jesus came to take everything that had been written in Scripture up to that time in history and say, let me show you how it's really supposed to be understood and lived out. He doesn't do away with the law and the prophets, he fulfills them. He helps us understand the fullness of them. What Jesus is questioning is the legalistic and limited interpretation of the religious leaders of his day. In his day... And become about legalism, following certain rules and regulations. And once you could check those things off, you were done. So Jesus isn't questioning what the Old Testament said. He's fulfilling that. What Jesus is doing, he's questioning how the word of God was interpreted by the teachers and the leaders of the day. And he's saying, let me tell you what it's really supposed to mean. Let me get you to where you're really supposed to be. And I think this is critical because I think we do the same thing. We can too quickly go, oh, okay, that part of the Bible got it covered, never did that, started doing that, I'm good. But there's more to it than meets the eye. So Jesus, is, here's what he's doing. He's calling us to take it up a notch. He wants his followers to move from what I call, move from check to Christ-likeness. For many Christians today, this is their view of their spiritual life. Okay, what does the Bible say? They get the plainest, most simple meaning, and they go, okay, check, didn't do it. Check, did it. Check, done. And we move on. What's next, God? What's next? He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. In those days, people said, when the Bible says do not murder, everybody's going, okay, I didn't kill anybody. Check. And you just no, there's more going on here. Slow down. Take it up a notch. It's not just about check. It's about Christ-likeness. It's about becoming like Jesus, living a transformed life. That's what it's about. And the problem is, when we get into just this routine of a spiritual life where we say, do this, do this, do this, check, 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 don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, check, 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 our whole spiritual life is just bland. There's no flavor to it. There's no excitement. When we follow Jesus and try to become like him, he takes it up a notch and up a notch and up another notch. This leads us away from a bland spiritual life 
into a spiced up existence. So here's my question for you today. As we begin our journey this summer, as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount, we hear the, the most famous, best sermon in the history of the world, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Here's my question. Will you dare to ask God to spice up your spiritual life? Will you dare to say, God, you know, take some spicy truth and just go, bam, take it up a notch. You know, spice up my spiritual life. For some of you, you're a longtime believer. Say, God, take me to a new place of loving you, a new passion for you. Some of you are new believers. God, take it up a notch for me to a deeper place spiritually. Some of you don't know Jesus yet. And maybe you're taking up a notch and saying, I want to know this Jesus who spoke with such wisdom and such power. Maybe for you, it's just coming to know Jesus and learning what it is to walk with him and to follow him. So I want to pray a simple prayer, but it's a bold prayer. And I want to invite you to pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, spice up our spiritual lives. Take us up a notch. Take us away from the bland, routine, checklist faith and lead us into a bold, spiced up, tasty, amazing, challenging walk with you. We pray this for your glory. We pray this for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we'll begin in verse 21. And we're going to look at this, this teaching of Jesus about murder, but how he, he not only takes it up a notch, he takes it up three notches. And you'll see this as we walk through the passage. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 21. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry Oh, wait a minute. Anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. That's taking it up a notch. Next notch. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Whoa. <laughs> Jesus says, you know, you've heard it said to not commit murder. But he says, but I'm going to take it beyond that. We're going to address three other topics beyond just killing someone. But let me say, let's start with the main dish here. Okay, let's, let's stop and pause for a moment before we jump to the other three things. Let's look at what Jesus is saying at first. The main dish is this, don't murder. Before you spice up, you got to get the main dish to spice up, right? And Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, do not murder. Now, we have to understand what that means. There's seven words for killing in the Hebrew language. Seven different words. And they have subtleties and nuance. They mean different things. This word here, this one means killing a person, specifically killing a person with premeditated and deliberate malice. This is murder, killing another human being. And for the record, God is just as against this today as he was back then. Murder is sin. Taking the life of a person made in God's image in anger and malice breaks the heart of God. When God said, do not murder, he was talking very specifically about killing a person in a premeditated and malicious manner. And God says, I'm against that, then, now, and forever. Because every human being is made in the image of the living God. And so we have to hear that. Now, before I jump past that for practical application, let me say, in a church the size of Shoreline, with three services in this room and three services in the family worship venue, and what's happening in the cafe, what will happen in our service tomorrow night, Monday night here, what's happening on Pacific Grove on our campus there, with our different military gatherings and our online community, it's a lot of people. And for some of you, you might actually be in a place where you are so angry, so bitter, so hurt, you feel so cornered and trapped, you're actually thinking about taking someone's life. And I don't want to go past that without pausing and, and saying, that is not God's design. Whatever they've done, whatever has happened, talk to a pastor, talk with a Christian counselor, talk with somebody, talk with a family member, say, I am so angry. There's thoughts going through my mind. There's things I'm thinking of doing and just bring it from the darkness into the light and deal with it. I don't want to assume that that couldn't happen because I walk with pastor friends of mine who've had people in their congregation kill someone and had to walk through that. And I want to say to all of you, that is not God's design. That's not God's plan. If you find that growing in your heart, deal with it. Get help immediately, quickly. So Jesus says, do not commit murder. But then he takes it up a notch. He pushes it beyond just don't kill someone. It's a bigger picture here. 
So look with me back again at Matthew 5, 21. Let's read this again. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and that anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And we agree, that's wrong, that's not God's plan. Verse 22, he takes it up a notch. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Notice it says with a brother or sister. This is talking about a Christian with a brother or sister in Christ. He's saying if you're carrying anger between you and another person, he says that's also wrong. That can become murderous. That can lead to killing, maybe killing a reputation, killing with your eyes, killing with your words, but it's dangerous territory. So as he takes it up a notch, Jesus is saying anger hidden in your heart and poisoning your soul is also deadly. It is deadly to carry anger in your heart and let it poison your soul. He's not talking about a little moment of frustration. Oh, that's frustrating. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about anger, the seething, boiling anger. He's not talking about righteous anger. There's times where there's, as as a Christian, there's things that we should be upset about because we have a a desire for the holiness of God. What Jesus is talking about is a deep-rooted, internal, this nursed and growing condition of the heart of one Christian toward another. He's talking about this place where our anger bubbles and boils and stews in our souls. It's that little back burner of your heart where you got a little pot back there and there's somebody's name on that pot and it's just kind of boiling and bubbling. Because if you knew what he did to me, you'd know why I have a right to keep that right there. Just boiling and boiling. I kind of like having it there. It just reminds me how angry I am. If you knew how she treated me, you'd know why that pot's right there. Some of you have this seething, bubbling, stewing anger towards somebody. Towards somebody who also loves Jesus. But something's happened between you and them. And you're holding it against them. Some of you have a stove in your heart with five or six or seven or eight different pots with names on it of people who you won't talk to, you're angry with, they've hurt you, and if you knew why, and I'll never forgive her, and I'll never talk to him again, and you're just boiling, 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 boiling anger. And what you don't realize is Jesus is saying, this is a, becomes a form of killing. You kill your own soul. You live like that, you kill your own soul. You kill your relational world. Sometimes you kill your friendship with God when you get enough of those pots boiling. Jesus says, be careful. Be careful when anger is with a brother or sister is boiling in your soul. And Jesus actually says, if you're letting that happen, if you leave that alone, just let that keep boiling inside you, he says, you're subject to judgment. He says, you're actually subject to to be judged. Now, in in the ancient world, in the context of when it says that word judgment, it's talking about uh, the ancient world, the way that they judged people, dealt with things, was in community. They got out in the open. They talked about it. They would gather in the city gate, the small towns, small cities. In the city gate, the elders of the city would be there certain times, and people would bring their concerns. They'd bring their complaints. That person wronged me. I'm so angry at that person. That person did this. That person did that. And then they would talk it through and work it out. So if you're living with those bubbling, boiling pots of anger stewing in your soul, you should bring it out. You should be bring it out to the community. Get godly, wise Christian people and say, "I can't fix this. I can't deal with my anger. I can't get over it. Help me." Because in the city gate, when they would gather and they would bring judgment upon that, it wasn't just judge you're bad, naughty. It was judgment. Let's deal with it. Face it. Seek reconciliation. For some of you right now, you would say, you know, when it comes to my walk with Jesus, when it comes to the issue of murder, I've never killed anybody. Not planning on it. Got no intention. The problem is, you're not living like Christ. You're letting anger and bitterness stew in your soul and boil and bubble over. And eventually, that pot overflows. It always does. So Jesus is saying, be so careful. Look at these things. Deal with these things. Get it out into community. Get some godly people together to talk with you, to help you work through it. Bring it into community where there can be judgment and wisdom and conviction and challenge so you'll actually deal with it. So Jesus takes it up a notch, but he doesn't stop there. He goes another step. So look with me back at Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 22. We'll read the passage again up to the new part of the passage. So Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. 
But I tell you that anyone who's angry with his brother or sister, we just talked about that, will be subject to judgment. Now he takes it up another notch. Watch this. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, this is a Christian to Christian again, anyone says to his brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. Anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka. Now, Jesus is taking up a next notch. Here's what he's saying. An attitude of contempt born of pride has power to devastate and destroy. When you have an attitude of contempt, oh, you are such a raka. Raka. That, that word, uh, it, that word is, it's, it's a tricky word. The word raka is a picture of arrogant elitism. And it has meanings like, and I, these are not even words you want to say, but you know, like, like you know, idiot, brainless fool. You know, the, the word rock, but it's not just the word, it's the tone of it. It has this, this, I'm up here looking down on you. You are such a rock. What is wrong with you? How can, it's, it's, it's this arrogant looking down. And he's saying when one Christian looks at another Christian and says, rock, what is wrong with you? How can you not figure that out? What is wrong with you? Man, he says, something's Wrong. You, you, that should be brought before the Supreme Court. It's that dangerous. It's that hurtful. It's that painful. And this attitude, this, this, this arrogant, prideful, contemptuous attitude of looking down on someone's can be based on all kinds of things. And we don't like to think of ourselves this way, but I think for all of us at certain moments, we can have this kind of an attitude. Sometimes it's based on economic position. Sometimes it's intellectual ability or accomplishment. Sometimes it's religious position or any other superior attitude. So, so somebody looks at somebody else, and they, they have a lot. I mean, they've made it. And they've got lots of resources. And they can look at someone else and go, what's wrong with them, those people who can't pull themselves up by their own bootstraps like I do? What a bunch of rockers. That's the attitude that can, when a Christian looks at other people with that attitude, something's wrong. It could be intellectual. You know, ha. How do they not get it? What's wrong with these people? How do they not get it? I mean, it's so clear to me. What's wrong with them? That kind of an attitude. And worst of all, spiritually. You know, when somebody who is a follower of Jesus becomes so full of themselves and so full of their spirituality and so full of their, they get so filled with spiritual pride and arrogance, they look at other Christians and judge them because they're not... You know, quite as good and quite as holy and quite as moral and quite as together as, I don't know, for instance, me. You know, they're not, they're, it's, it's, it's just this, I'm up here and I'm looking down, judging people, condemning them because they aren't measuring up. And Jesus says, man, that should be brought before the Supreme Court. Now, the Sahedron, this, 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 the court of the day, was not one that would take trials like that. That would be too small. And the reality was, from Jesus' teaching, most of the people in that court were very arrogant and proud and would have been condemned to the very same thing. But Jesus said, be careful. Be careful if you're a follower of Jesus. And if you're not yet, if you become one, that you don't sort of get the spiritually superior attitude or I've arrived financially, or morally, or you know, intellectually, and now I can kind of look down on people. Because you know what? You'll kill people that way. You'll kill them with your eyes. You'll kill them with your attitude. You'll kill them with your words. What is wrong with you? Raka. Man, Jesus, be careful. Because murder is more than just killing someone. There's lots of ways to injure people, lots of ways to hurt people, lots of ways to kill people. And, and, and so we have to be careful. This sin is so dangerous and so serious that it should come before the Supreme Court, Jesus says. This is such a big deal. So deal with it. So pause and ask yourself, you know, is that ever, do I ever get that kind of superior attitude? That prideful attitude, contempt of others. Even, it could be even a whole group of people. Oh, that, that political persuasion, psh, what a bunch of rockas. They don't get it, you know? They don't see the world the way I do. Oh, that group of people from that part of the world, oh, what a bunch of, I mean, we can just, we can do it with groups and individuals. Be so careful, because we're talking about Christ-likeness, being like Jesus. Not just check, 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 
but transformation and taking our hearts up to a whole new place of surrender and obedience to Jesus. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He pushes it one more level. So back to the passage. Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and that anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. We talked about that, that murder is wrong. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Don't let those pots of anger boil and, and, and grow in your hearts in that growing, seething anger. Watch out for that. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. Be careful you don't have the superior elite attitude over other people. And then Jesus says this. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now notice in that third time Jesus takes it up a notch, notice what's missing. He doesn't say, if you do this to your brother or sister. He's no longer talking about other Christians at this point. He's talking about people in general, people out in the world. And this word, this word fool, uh, he, he's getting at a bigger picture. Here's how Jesus takes it up a notch for the third thing. It says, attitudes and behaviors that shame, belittle, and mock non-believers who are slaves to sin and morally corrupt. And this is an offense in the eyes of God. She says, be careful if you're a Christian, that you're not looking at other people who aren't Christians and judging their lives because they're moral fools in your sight. How could they look at the way they live? Look what all this is wrong with them. And you begin to condemn them and shame their name and speak ill of them. Because, you know, because now you've got Jesus and you're so cleaned up and they're just so messed up. He says, be very careful. And if you do that, he says, you're dancing on the edge of hell. Let me tell you what Jesus is getting at there. Anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. The word moros, this word for fool, is a moral fool. It's somebody who's morally foolish in how they live. And this is what happens when we mock, rip down, belittle, and slander the name of a person who is lost in sin and far from Jesus. When we kill their name and we kill their reputation. And Christians, we can do that. And Jesus is warning us, be careful. Because here's the reality. Jesus came to you and to me in our lostness, our brokenness, our moral filth, and our rebellion, and our hatred of him. And he loved us. And he died on the cross for us. And he paid the price for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us in our place for our sins. He paid the price. And now we're cleansed, and we look at other people who were where we used to be, and we go, what's wrong with these people? What about your moral fools? You see the problem? Jesus, be careful. At this point, when you start thinking that way and act that way, you're like dancing along the edge of hell. He's not saying you're going to hell. When you come to know Jesus, you put your faith in you, you belong to Jesus. But he's saying, man, you're acting like somebody who lives on the edge. You don't even get who I've made you, how I've saved you, how I've cleansed you. When you've been cleansed by the grace of Jesus and made new and born again and washed clean, and then you and I stand back in judgment over people who don't yet know Jesus, and we judge and condemn them and push them away, instead of love and embrace them, we've missed the point of the gospel. The forgiveness that cleansed us is what we should extend to them. Jesus says, be careful when you look at someone who's not yet a Christian and call them a moral fool. And you, and you don't kill them, but you kill their reputation by the way you talk about them. And you kill your relationship by the way you treat them. Jesus says, be so careful. So I want to pause and I just want to do a brief moral inventory of our own lives. How are we doing? I'm not talking about just check. Killed anybody lately? Plan on killing anybody? I'm not talking that. Don't do that, obviously. But I'm talking about Christ-likeness. So let me ask you four questions. And I want you just between you and God to take a minute and, and think about this. All right, just grapple with this. If you want to take it up a notch, you have to be humble enough to acknowledge where maybe some of these things that Jesus is teaching Hit home. So four questions. Do I live in a way that could put me in a place where I could actually physically murder someone? Think about it. Am I getting so angry, so bitter, feel so cornered? Man, I don't know what I'd do. And if you are, talk to God about it. Get some help. Deal with it. Am I nursing and holding on to anger against a brother or sister in Christ? Do I got a couple pots on the back burner of my heart just bubbling and boiling with anger? And man, I think about how 
how much I'm mad at them and upset at them. And I, it's been two months. It's been two years. It's been 20 years. And it just bubbles and bubbles and bubbles. Is that going on? You got a pot or two boiling on the heart of your life? You got five or 10 pots boiling? Talk to God about it. Confess it. Talk to one of Shoreline's lay counselors. They're free. They'll meet you for eight sessions and walk you through just life stuff. Talk with a pastor. Talk with a Christian friend. But address it. Question three. Do I look down on other Christians with arrogance and contempt? Have I become that person who thinks I've arrived in some way? So I can look down on other Christians, other groups of Christians, other people in other churches, other people who don't get it quite the way I do, do I, Have I let that happen in my heart? And if I have, oh God, forgive me. Don't bring me before the court. Let me just come to other people and say, man, I got, a, I got an issue here. Help me. And then a fourth question. Do I think or speak ill of non-believers who live in moral corruption? Have I become the final court of appeals for everybody else who doesn't know Jesus? And I can talk bad about that group or those people or that, that individual. I mean, I can speak ill of them. I can slander their name and their reputation because, I mean, look at how bad they are. I mean, how can I not talk bad about them? Look at them. Right? And God says, wait a minute. You're dancing on the edge of hell. Be careful. When you were totally lost, totally sinful, totally immoral, God loved you. And if you're still there, he loves you. And his people should love you too not condemn you, not judge you. And, and I apologize for Christians who treat non-Christians with judgment and hate and scorn. We may disagree, but as Christians, this is what we bring, the love of Jesus. Because that's what he brought to us. And so what Jesus does now in the passage is he gives just two key thoughts, two things that, that I think should be transformational in how we deal with these things. The first is this. The first is found in verse 23. The first big lesson Jesus teaches is this. Unresolved anger and brokenness in our relationships can and will impact our relationship with God. Jesus, understand something, Jesus says. You think that your conflict with that person and that wall you built between that person is just about you and that person. It's not. Your conflict with another human being and the walls you build between them impact your relationship with God. So no, it doesn't impact mine. Jesus says it does. Listen to what he says in Matthew 5, 23. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. This is actually them having concern with you. Either way, he says it's a problem. But they have something against you. Listen to the advice Jesus gives. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, to your brother or sister that you have this conflict with. And then come and offer your gift. You see what Jesus is saying? He's saying, listen, in your relational world, when you've built a fence between you and another person, another Christian, a family member, a neighbor, a friend, and there's this wall between you, this fence between you, and you've built it because I'm not going to let them hurt me again, and I'm going to show them, and I'm not going to love them again, and I would never forgive them, and you build this big, tall fence. She says, be careful, because every fence you build between you and another person, you're also building a fence between you and God. You hear that? On the day of Yom Kippur, the, the high day in the history of God's people for forgiveness, Yom Kippur was the day of atonement. The rabbis would say, if you're, you, you can come to God and be re restored to your relationship with God. No matter what you've done, you can come to God and be restored. But here's what they said. But first, get right with your neighbors and your friends. Because until you deal with that, it's tough to deal with this. And for some of you, you have four or five or six boiling pots of anger, four or five or six fences between you and other people. And you can't figure out, God, I'm praying and I'm seeking you. I don't feel close to you, God. I don't know why. God, I can't figure out why I don't feel connected with you. It's like, well, I don't relate with people. I'm angry. I'm bitter. I'm building walls. And God says, if you've got an issue with you and another person and you're coming to worship, go deal with that. And when you deal with that and when it goes away, guess what? This opens up. <laughs> there's, some, there's something going on here that Jesus says. The two things in all the universe that matter most, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the two biggies. Love God, love people. And those things are connected. You can't be hate-filled and angry and bitter and judgmental and condemning of a bunch of people in your life and expect to have a vibrant closeness with God. 
So for some of you, it's going to be deal with those things so you can get this going. And then Jesus talks about the timing of all of this as he continues teaching in verse 25. The second big lesson is time is of the essence. Don't wait to seek restoration. Do your part as soon as you possibly can. Not next Wednesday, not next Friday, not two months from now, today. So Jesus says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and the officer may throw you into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus says, deal with it. My anger is boiling. My pride as I look down on people. My judgment of non-believers for not being the right kind of people. They don't, they don't know yet what that looks like. They don't know yet know, know Jesus. And Jesus says, deal with it and deal with it quickly. And some of you right now, no way. You don't know what he did. You don't know what she did. I have a right, I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna turn the heat up on that pot. I'm not just gonna turn it down. And some of you are like, I'm not. There's two topics that I preach on that I get the most pushback on. Giving, financial giving, and forgiveness. Those are the two that people come back and say, you don't understand. I'm telling you, God understands. He came to you and me when we were totally lost in sin, totally bitter, and totally hard-hearted towards him, and he gave his life, and he died on the cross, and he paid the price. And he says, be like Jesus. And that may mean in the next three or four hours, you got to talk with somebody. For some of you, it might be on the drive home with a person in the car. <laughs> For some of you, maybe picking up a phone. I don't know. And you look at that person and you say, I want to do all I can to make it right. Where I've messed up, I am sorry. Forgive me. You may just need to say, say I... I don't even know where it went wrong and how things got upside down. I just know that I, there's this wall between us and I don't want it there anymore. What's it gonna take? Can we meet? Can we talk? But you start down that road. Jesus takes this seriously and so should we. It's not enough to say I didn't murder anybody. Do you murder with your eyes, daggers? Do you murder with your words as you, as you slander someone's reputation? Do you murder as you call someone a fool, a moral fool? fool. Or as you say, Raka, what's wrong with you? Can't you, what, you have rocks in your head? If we're doing those things, Jesus, it's time to change. And some of you say, man, what, what if I go to someone and I try to restore and they don't want to? Or I've tried. I've tried and tried. They don't want to. My encouragement would be this. Try at least one more time. Just drop them a note say, I'd love to try to figure it. If somebody says, I will not, and they, they push you at arms like this, I will not be restored to you, then this is what you say to them. You say, listen, the door is open. When you're ready, if you ever want to talk, I'm here. You can't keep bashing down the door, but you can say, my door's open and my heart's open. And I'm ready to say I'm sorry for everything I've done that's wrong. And that's probably plenty for all of us. But I want to work this out. And we'll look at some other ways to do this as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount. But you get the picture here? You want a bland spiritual life? Just deal with check. You know, okay, yeah, didn't do that, check. You want a vibrant spiritual life? You want to take it up a notch? Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to say to you, but you I've heard, you've heard that this was written, but I'm telling you, there's more to the story. And murder is more than killing somebody. It's anger seething in our hearts. Jesus says, deal with it. It's contempt and pride that looks down on somebody else. Jesus says, deal with it. It's a Christian looking at somebody who's not a Christian and judging and condemning them instead of loving and reaching out to them. Jesus says, it's time to live like Jesus. I mean, you take it up a notch, it might be a little uncomfortable, a little spicy, a little more challenging. You ready for it? You ready for that? Then come back next week. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love your word. It challenges us. It stretches us. Lord, there is nothing boring. There's nothing bland about the Christian life. But Jesus is walking with you in your presence learning to become more like you. This, is, this will stretch us, Lord. This will spice up every day of our life. And I pray that we will leave here not blocking out what your word says, 
Not just checking off the list that we haven't killed anybody, so we're okay. But let us hear your voice. Let us deal with it quickly. And Lord, any walls that we have between people in our lives, may we go after those and do all we can to tear them down so that we can love people well, and God, we can love you well. Grow our hearts this summer. Make it an amazing summer, Lord, as you take us up another notch in our spiritual lives. We pray this in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. I want to hand our venues off to their venue pastors around the campus here. They'll share a few words with you. Well, thank you so much for being part of our worship service today. And, and you may have noticed in this message today that there's a real challenge for spiritual growth. To not just go to church, not just follow a service online, uh, not just even put your faith in Jesus, but to grow and to walk more closely with him. One of the best ways you can do that is to dig into his word. Uh, there's all kinds of Bibles. Here at Shoreline, we use the NIV, and this is a study Bible. If you've never gotten a study Bible before, if you've never used a study Bible, I'd encourage you to not only have your own Bible, but to go deeper, to learn about the history, the background, the, the context of what's happening. So I encourage you to get a Bible and to read it every day. If you're not sure where to start, go on our website and just follow the daily reading and click right on to any device or turn in your Bible and follow that section. That'll get re you ready for next week's message. I also want to encourage you to take some next steps in your spiritual growth. You can go onto Shoreline's website, you'll see the address right here on the screen, and take next steps of growth. We have all kinds of resources and materials. Take another step, go deeper. If you look on the website, you can't find what you need, give us a call at the church. But we want to help you take more steps in your spiritual growth. Well, God bless you, have a great week, and hopefully we'll see you back here next week.